That's all you've got to just be strong And it's a fight just to keep it together Together I know you think that you are too far gone But hope is never lost Hope is never lost What's up, church? How's everybody doing today? How's everybody doing today? Can I have all y'all stand up? It is a beautiful Sunday. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. Before we start, um, I, I, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit reveal to you how much he has done in your life. Uh, often we come to church and we want to hear something new and we want to get encouraged for the week. And I want to encourage you that whenever you come here, usually the Holy Spirit is not revealing to you anything new. He's just revealing to you something you already know in a different way. And why that is important is that you have a lot more spiritual resource and faithful, faithfulness of God history to draw on than what you hear in here. And so hopefully God stirs your heart today to help you realize that you have, he has done so much in your life. And what you're going through right now, you have a reservoir of experience to draw on to know that God is never going to leave you or forsake you. Can I get an amen? Lord, I pray you bless us today. I pray you encourage us today. I pray you stir us up today. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at the person next to you and say, God got you. <laughs> Get your Bibles out, get your Bibles out. On the count of three, say word. <laughs> One, two, three, say word. One more time, say word. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Hopefully you're reading through the Bible. Still with us, we are in 2 Chronicles starting today. 2 Chronicles 16, you will read this story in a few days. Whenever I go home to New York or go to college, my college in Connecticut, and visit with my friends, we always end up talking about the past. Dudes talk about the girlfriend they wish they could have had, even though they could have never had her. <laughs> Dudes talking about, you know, I could have gone pro, even though they, they don't even play anything. And <laughs> I could have been rich if I had more money, you know, all kind of stuff. And, all, all the stuff, I could have graduated if I would have read a book. Um, but we're always dwelling on in the past and someone will inevitably say in that conversation, uh, you need to stop dwelling on the past. Um, we're going to start a series today called When Bad Things Happen. Everyone say when bad things happen. Not why do bad things happen. Bad things happen we live in a fallen world. People are evil. We make mistakes. We do stupid stuff. That's, there's a whole lot of obvious reasons why bad things happen. But the question is, what do you do when they happen? So we're going to talk about today. And today's message, we're going to talk about in this series. Today's message is that I want to encourage you when bad things happen, that you need to dwell on the past. That in the past, God has gotten you through a whole bunch of stuff. And in the past, you were two things. One, you were loyal to God. And because of your loyalty to God, God got you through. And this story we're going to look at is about a king who did something and a prophet is going to come to him and tell him you should have dwelt on the past. So what I want to encourage you today as we talk about this is I want you to be thinking about something you're going through right now. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would... 
reminds you of what God has already done in your life because of your faithfulness. And by the way, what God has done in your life even when you weren't faithful. And how he was strong on your behalf. We're going to do this by dwelling on what's happening right now in your life. Excuse me. <clears throat> how you're not being faithful. But how you were faithful in the past. And then we're going to write a short uh, dwell on the past declaration prayer for you to pray on every day to encourage you. Now, before we get started, I want you to by a show of hands. How many of you are going through something right now? And that's just not positive. You have a drama in your life, you have pain in your life, whatever, a situation that you don't like. Just raise your hand really high. Very good. And by the way, as I reminded, when we raise our hand here, we put an elbow above our ear. Just raise your hand really high. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Very good. You know what the Bible says? Uh, it, it, God will never let you be tempted beyond what you can take. And, and nothing has overtaken you except what is common to man, First Corinthians tells us. In other words, you're not the only one. Many people have been there before. You've been there before. You went through this before. And so don't think you're all by yourself because often when we go through something, we will hear that voice, your life is over, your career is over, you're going to die, you're never going to have love in your life, you're going to be broke, you're going to be homeless. And the devil starts throwing all this doomsday on you and it catastrophizes your situation. And God is saying, hold up, hold up, hold up. We've been through this before. You and me, been through this before many times. And I got you through, even when you weren't faithful. But there were times when you were faithful. There were times when you trusted me. So I want to encourage you that you have more history in your life of positive things than you know. And when you come to church, when you come to church, you can come say, I want to hear something. But understand this, whatever you hear in church, ask yourself, Did, have I done this in my life before? Have I lived this truth before? And what did God do before? Because if you can write history, write, write stories and incidences of your faithfulness, things that nobody can take away from you. There was a guy in the Bible who was blind and, and when he got healed, the, the, the religious hypocrites were saying that Jesus who heals you, he's a, he's a false prophet. And the guy said, look, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about that dude other than this. I was blind, now I see so you could say anything you want, but you can't take that away from me. What God, can, what no one can take away from you is what God has already done in your life. And if you had a list of all those amazing things God has done in your life, you would have a foundation upon which to build your faith. Can I get an amen? Okay, so in this story, we're going to be, come on, come on now, come on now. If you went home right now, if I just prayed and you went home right now, and you wrote down as many things as you can remember, you would get this much out of this sermon. Right now. So I want, I want you to don't forget what we just said. Now, in this story, it is about a king named Asa and Basha. Now, quick history. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Israel had how many sons? Everyone say 12. So the nation of Israel has 12 tribes. After, when, because Solomon's unfaithfulness, they, God split the nation of Israel and he formed two tribes in the bottom called Judah in the south. Ten tribes in the north combined were called Israel. So when you're reading the Bible, you're going to see Judah, Israel, Judah, Israel. That is the 12 tribes split ten and two. So Asa was king of the south, Judah. Basha was king of the north, Israel. Basha was going to attack his brothers in the south. Asa, instead of trusting God, instead of praying to God as he had done in the past, he took money out of the treasuries of the Lord and paid the king of Syria to come against Basha to set him free. So instead of trusting in God, he trusted in his money and trusted in another enemy to come against his brother. And what we're going to read in the story is that when that happens, a man of God, Hanani, the prophet, the Bible calls in this particular case a seer, comes and says, thus saith the Lord, you did the wrong thing. You should have dwelt on the past. You should have remembered what you did in the past when you got in trouble, when you got attacked, and prayed to God. And so therefore you will be judged because you took the wrong path. My encouragement to you is that you think about what you're going through now and look in the past at all the times you were faithful, loyal to God. 
That's your loyalty. You are committed to your relationship with God. And all the times God was strong on your behalf. And by the way, just as a survey, how many of you by a show of hands believe that at any time in your life, even for one second, you are stronger than God? Anybody? You are stronger than God? <laughs> you misunderstood the question. I get it. You misunderstood the question. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16, Second Chronicles 16, verse 1. It says, in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Second Chronicles 16, 1. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me and not attack me. Verse 5. Now what happened when Basha heard it, that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. And at that time, Hananiah the seer, verse 7, at that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said, because you relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Verse 8. Then he says, weren't the Ethiopians... And the Lubin, not a large army very, with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. We're going to read this in a minute. But in the past, chapter 14, two chapters before, a million, an army of a million men came against Asa. And all he did was pray to God and God delivered him. He's saying, don't you remember in the past when that army of a million people came against you? And you prayed and God got you through. By a show of hands, by a show of hands, by a show of hands. How many of you in the past, you had an impossible situation. Like it is the end of the world. There's no way. And you were telling me, I don't know what's going to happen. It's never going to work. It's impossible. It's just no way. And, and you, you, no one could talk you out of this being the end of the planet Earth in your life. And God got you through. Raise your hand. Come on now, Jesus. Come on now. Come on now, Jesus. And by the way, if I ask you how many times, that happened like a hundred times. How many of y'all can say that happened a hundred times? Come on now, Jesus. <laughs> and by the way, can I, how many times did he never come through? Can any of you say he never came through? Every time. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and afro throughout the whole earth. <laughs> so when you think afro, you think of round afro. That's an afro right there. That's an afro. That is the globe. That is me at 15. Amen. <laughs> The eyes of the Lord is running through my hair. <laughs> it's running to and afro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal. Everyone say strong. strong. Say loyal. Yeah. This verse is so profound. Here's what God's doing. If I can find somebody who is white, I will be strong for them. That's not what it says. If I can find someone who's black. Not what it's if I can find someone who's Middle Eastern, if I can find someone who's cute, someone who's rich, someone who's poor, someone who's educated, he didn't say any of that. I just want someone to be loyal. That's the criteria. There's no other criteria. Someone who will trust me, someone who will have faith. The Bible says the just, the just shall walk by faith. So the Bible says, God says, look, I... <laughs> God is looking for people to show himself strong on their behalf if they will be loyal. Number one in your notes, let's talk about where you're at now. Describe how your pain has caused your heart to compromise your loyalty. In other words, you have to be convinced that the way you're doing it now potentially is not working. What are you doing now to deal with your drama? You're cursing, you stop 
reading your Bible, stop praying, stop attending church, stop going to D group. The, the, the D group, the discipleship groups we have is a perfect venue for you to have a relationship with people and to talk to people about your problems. I can't tell you how many times I meet people in the mall, wherever, a store, whatever, and they go, hey, Pastor Mike, go to church. Hey, when's the last time you've been to church? Well, you see, what happened was I had this problem in my life and I got drama, so I stopped going to church. That's the last thing you need us to do it. And instead, now I'm going to the club. Instead, I'm now watching pornography. Instead, I'm, going, I'm doing all this stuff that's further exacerbating the, <laughs> and making the problem worse. <laughs> Why weren't you loyal? You didn't trust God? You didn't think he was faithful? You didn't think he would get you through? Think about your history. And 1B, describe the result of your lack of loyalty. When you are not loyal, what happens? You get addicted. You create more problems. You dig a deeper hole. You alienate. You destroy your health. You just have to pause and don't let the devil get you caught up in chasing something that you'll never get. Without realizing I'm on the wrong treadmill. That you have to get off and say, Lord, instead of you saying, I'm going to do this in the future, I want you to do this first. I want you to dwell on the past. This is also true. Listen, we have D groups and we had a D group training and we have a journal for our D groups. And as part of the D group journal, when you read through the Bible, every single day when God says something to you, that as you learn something, and you should apply this. Um, here at church. Whenever you learn something, our tendency is to say, I learned that I need to forgive my enemies. I learned I need to be generous. Before you put a burden on yourself to do something in the future, before you make another New Year's resolution that you're most likely going to break, especially if you make them every day or every week, you can't hardly remember them. That you say, when did I apply that principle that I just learned in the past? When, was, when did God do something in my life in the past that was po positive? Because like I said, you're probably not going to learn a whole lot of new concepts. It's just you're going to hear it in a different way. And if you look back in your life, in your history, last week, last year, five years ago, throughout your life and say, man, I did that. Me and God went through that five times that I can remember Look at all the activity of God in my life. And if God did it then, he's going to do it again. We just sang that song. If God did it, then he's going to do it again. So if I have all this history of God's faithfulness in my life, God's patience in my life, my faithfulness in God, my trust in God, if I, if I, if I see that I did it before, I am going to now have the, the encouragement to now do it again. When, when David killed Goliath, Goliath... I'm, the, the Philistines were on one hill, the Israelites on another hill. There was a valley in the middle and Goliath came down the valley and for 40 days straight talked trash and yelled to the Israelites and said, if you could send one soldier to beat me, we will all serve you. We don't all have to fight, just one-on-one. -on -one. That's a pretty cool concept. None of the Israelites went. David comes because he, he was going there to see his brothers because he was a little kid taking care of the sheep. He went to see his brothers and he heard the Goliath talking all this trash and he starts telling the army, I could whoop that giant, but he was a little kid. And the King Saul said, who's that kid saying he can whip the giant? And he, and he said, bring him in here. He went to the king's tent and said, king, I can whip the giant. And the king said, you can't, you're just a little boy. And here's what David said. When I used to keep my father's sheep, which was that morning, he was a shepherd that day. But he realized I'm a giant killer now. <laughs> I just left the sheep. I just said, I'll be right back. And I came out here. <laughs> And here's what he said, when a lion or bear took one of the sheep, I know sheep doesn't have an S, but bear with me, took one of the sheep out of the flock, I would attack the lion and bear and take the sheep out of his mouth. If the Lord, 1 Samuel 16, 34, read it yourself, when, if the Lord in the past delivered me from the paw of the lion, if the Lord in the past delivered me from the paw of the bear, if God was faithful then, he will be faithful now. That's your story. 
That's your story. Number two, describe how your heart expressed its loyalty through a trial in the past. You cannot dwell on those stories enough. Let me tell you something. When I, when I retired from the Chargers, I hadn't officially retired, but it was right before I was going to retire. I had three children, one wife, a house, a rancher Penasquitas, and two cars. My wife had a car, I had a car. I just finished playing and I wanted to be in ministry. So I went to a pastor at the time, Mike McIntosh at Horizon, and said, hey, look, I, I started a ministry in my, in my house. I got these teenagers coming. Can I, I want to be a youth pastor. And he says, okay, we had previously spoken, but we were driving in the car. And he says, $500 a month is your salary. And, and, and I'm a numbers guy, so I know that. <laughs> My, I, I, I have four years of calculus. I could do quick ad. My mortgage was three times that. And so I had a car, five miles of feet. It, that just didn't add up. That would pay for my garage. <laughs> and in an instant, my brain went, Zzz, doesn't add up. Zzz, are you, you going to trust me? It, it, it was simultaneously. And in two seconds, that happened. And I said, I'll take the job. That's how I got into ministry. For three years, my salary, it took three years for my salary to catch up to my bills. So what did God do? He taught me to trust him for three years. Here you go. I'm going to take care of you. Just trust me. Just do what I told you to do. I'll take care of you. You have those stories. You have to remember those stories. You have to remember the faithfulness of God. You have to think, when was I, my loyalty to God, my faith in God, when did it pay off? To, look what it said, look at, turn, second, turn to 2 Chronicles 14, 9. This is the story of what Asa did. 2 Chronicles 14, 9, it says, Then Zerah the Ethiopian came out against him, 2 Chronicles 14, 9, came out against them with an army of a million men. Everyone say a million one million men, 300 chariots, and he came to uh, Marasha. So Asa went out against him, and they set troops in battle array in the valley of uh, Zephathah in Maserah. And, and Asa cried out to the Lord his God. Here's what he said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help. In other words, it's easy. Whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O oh Lord, our God. This is your prayer, by the way. This is your prayer. Help us, O oh Lord, our God. For we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O oh Lord. Everyone say, O oh Lord. You are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Why were you faithful to God in the past? Because you prayed to him. You read your Bible. Sometimes I talk to people and they go, man, you got to pray for me, Pastor. I'm just going through this hard time. And I, and, and I always say, okay, so what are you doing? Some will say, well, you know, I stopped going to church. Or some will say, man, I'm reading the Bible every day. Hey, listen to this narrative. Why don't you listen to this narrative? I'm reading the Bible every day. I'm praying. I'm in fellowship. I'm seeking God. Can you pray this trial goes away? And I'm thinking, I don't know if I want the trial to go away. This is not about trials going away and not coming. That's not the point. When bad things happen, how are you responding to it? How is God shaping you? What are you learning about your situation, yourself, your relationship with God, your perception? Because what happens is... Sometimes people will start praying and become faithful and, and they'll say, I've been praying and, and I'm reading the Bible and I'm saying, okay, this trial is happening, you're praying, reading the Bible and what's God doing in your life? Man, I have so much peace and he's teaching me all this stuff. And I'm like, that sounds like a lot of good stuff. And that sounds like if, if this trial goes away, you may stop doing this and go back to your old lackadaisical self, which happens often. What is God doing in your life when you are faithful? 
When you were faithful to share your faith, you were faithful to walk with God, you were faithful to serve, you, you say, oh, i got to start tithing, I'm, I'm in sin. And listen, God, God doesn't want you to do these things just so the pain will go away. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to walk with him. Because when bad things happen implies the obvious. Stuff happens. It's always going to happen. Matter of fact, when my father died, it hit me. I got to watch my father die. It hit me that the very last moments of earth is a bad thing. Now, dying and going to heaven is a good thing. But it could be very painful. And even in that moment, you could say, God has always been faithful to me. And I know when this ends, ooh, ooh, it's going to be good. Can I get amen? amen. Look, at, look, at, look at number two in your notes. Why was your heart loyal? Because God was faithful. Second Chronicles 14, 11. Asa cried out and said to the Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. 2B, describe God's response when you were loyal. What did God do in the past? God got you through financial problems. Watch this. You're not alone. How many of you God got, has gotten you through in the past multiple times financial issues? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Watch this. How many of you have ever thought... I'm going to be homeless and lose everything. <laughs> I was in a man's jacuzzi. <laughs> Me and this guy, we're in the jacuzzi. In his house in Scripps Ranch. In his jacuzzi. He has a six-figure job, multiple six figures. And he was telling about him worrying about being homeless. Bruh. <laughs> Homeless? <laughs> That's so far from you. God has gotten you through multiple, multiple times. What has he done? He's gotten you through financial problems. He's gotten you through health problems. He's gotten you through relational problems. Here's your prayer. Look in your notes. Dwelling on the past declaration. My heart was loyal to God by, because God is blank. I was loyal to him by praying to him. I was loyal to him by waiting on him. I was loyal to him by being humble. I was loyal to him by pursuing him. I was loyal to him by being obedient to the things he was trying to get me to be obedient to for a long time. That's how I was loyal to him. And by the way, if you want to know the number one thing you should do, and any time you get in any situation with God, anytime anything happens in your life, the number one thing God wants you to do all the time, I can't tell you how many, what do I do, Pastor? What do I do? What do I do? Number one thing which applies to every situation, a hundred percent of the time. Obey God. Why do I know what he says? Read the Bible. The reason we're reading through the Bible is, one, we need to read the Bible every day. But two, get in the habit of hearing his voice. In my D group, I asked my guys, are you hearing God's voice more clearly now than when we started in January? And they were, absolutely. That is the foundation of your relationship with God. Are you hearing his voice? And if you could say, I was faithful to God by reading, by praying, by submitting myself to him. Because God is faithful, loving, powerful, consistent, loyal. And God was strong, which means he has the ability to move mountains in your life. What did he do? He saved my relationship. He saved my life. He got me a job. He fed me. He provided a car. And if you were to lay all those stones of remembrance out in your life, you will see that God has been so good to you. 
And when the devil comes and tells you God's going to forsake you, he's going to leave you, he's going to deny you, you say, fool, shut your mouth, Satan, because God will never do that. He has never done that in my past, and he's not going to start doing that now. I'm going to trust him through everything I go through. Can I get an amen? In a minute, we're going to pray. There's several groups of you, but I'm going to say this a couple. One, there's some of you, you have never given your life to Christ. You come to church, you're kind of checking it out, you're kind of on the outside. But you know what? I need to be all in with God. Because even you who have never asked Christ to be your Savior, you may be sitting there going, yeah, I've had some situations in my life. Could that be God? Absolutely. God leads us to repentance with his mercy. When I was 19 years old, I asked Christ to be my savior. I was in the department store in a black neighborhood because these two white hippies were in the store walking around with their long beards and bummy clothes looking like Charles Manson. And I looked at them and said, what are these dudes doing in this, in this neighborhood? They came over and shared the gospel with me, cold call. They had beat up Bibles, like I got saved right there on the spot. I went home that night, that right then with my girlfriend. I was staying at her house. And two, three days, I, I can't remember, it's a blur, it was like so long ago. I was laying in her bed, and Jesus appeared to me in the room. Physically, Star Trek beamed in, no joke, and I'm sitting there tripping. I tried to yell to her, nothing would come out of my mouth. I tried to move my arms, couldn't, I was frozen. My pores opened so sweat would come out, and the sweat in my body said, I ain't coming out there. I couldn't sweat. Didn't say anything to me. I was wide awake, fully conscious, and then he disappeared. Then he went away. I remember walking into the kitchen she was in, and I, I started to tell her, I said, she, it, it don't even make sense. What's the point? That even, did I deserve the presence of God in my life like that? No. God is gracious to you. He is drawing you close to him with his goodness. So some of you need to say, listen, Lord, I'm in. I want to be loyal to you so you can be strong on my behalf for your glory. There are some of you who need to give your life to Christ. There are some of you in here, you just have a burden that you're carrying. We want to pray for you. A man came to me this morning. He said, I was considering not coming to church anymore. And I came today. God wants to lift a burden off your life. And open your eyes up to how good he is to you. How good he has been to you. And get off your head of you telling God every day, prove your love to me every day. Prove your love to me every day. He's like, I've done so much, you forgot everything I've done. That you say, Lord, today I'm going to surrender my life. So I want to ask all you to bow your heads and close your eyes. All the campuses. Holy Spirit, open our eyes up to your love for us. Open your eyes up to the rich history we have of your faithfulness in our life. And every time we complain, we declare our lack of faith in your faithfulness. Lord, teach us to declare your faithfulness, your miraculous actions in our life, your love, your patience, your power, your consistency in our life. That as we declare those things from our mouth, the Bible says the mouth speaks and overflow the heart, that our mouth would declare the faithfulness of our heart. And if our heart doesn't believe it, our mouth would say it and our heart would follow our mouth. <laughs> So if you're saying today, I want to declare my trust in God by giving my life to him, or I want to declare my trust in God by casting my burdens on him, I want you to pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I need you. Dear God, I love you. Dear God, you have been so faithful to me. You sent your son to die for me, rise from the dead.
I surrender my life to you. I surrender my burdens to you. I cast my cares on you because I know you care for me. I trust you, God. Jesus, send the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, into my life. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand on all the campuses. And as I ask you to stand in a minute, I'm going to count to three. If you want your family member or friend to stand with you, just tap them on the shoulder or in the hand or whatever it is. Some of you, God has been calling you for weeks and months and years and you've just been resisting and now is your time. Some of you are carrying a burden that you just need prayer for, you need a word of encouragement. The burden is gone. The Spirit of God just has taken that burden and putting it on his shoulders and he's given you his burden, which is light, the Bible says. So when I ask you to stand, there's nothing holding you down. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand declaring your faith in God. One, two, three. Stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.